Hi listeners, Jason here. We are excited to finally announce registrations for the biggest psych health and safety community event ever. The inaugural The Psych Health and Safety Conference will be held at the Sofitel Wentworth, Sydney, June 19 to 20, 2024, and offer concurrent virtual attendance. It'll feature live podcast recordings with OG researchers, including Christina Maslach and Michael Leiter of Burnout fame, Psych Health and Safety USA podcast host I, David Daniels, Australian super experts, including the likes of David Burrows, a special 10-year anniversary integrated approaches to workplace mental health panel with authors Tony LaMontagna, Angela Martin and Kat Page, hand-picked case studies from organisations doing it well, and a very special interview with plaintiff Zaggy Kozarov by Catherine Dunlop on that High Court case which we previously covered on the podcast. This event will sell out. Get in quick to secure tickets at early bird prices for the two-day conference, pre-conference masterclasses and the VIP dinner. The first 200 in-person registrations also get a copy of her latest book, The Burnout Challenge, signed by Christina Maslach herself. Find out more and register at www.psychhealthandsafetyconference.com. Now, on to this episode. From Flourish DX, this is the Psych Health and Safety Podcast. With workplace mental health becoming a safety prerogative, this is the source of information on psychological injury prevention and health promotion. It's a real pleasure to welcome Jason Van Shee to the Caring CEO. Welcome, Jason. Thanks for having me, Graham. What does care in the workplace mean to you? Ah, oh, I guess... Uh... As a leader, um, uh, it, it's important for me to uh, respond to people as, as people, right? Um, mm. I think too often in, in larger organisations, people can be see, seen as cogs uh, in a machine. Uh, I guess we're still fortunate that we're a company of about 20 people growing rapidly, but still you know, relatively small in comparison to many of the CEOs that you featured on the, the podcast. Um, and so, you know, we do have relationships with people. We do know everyone's kids' names. We do know um, you know, what they do on their, their weekends. So, and that's across the whole business, right? Not just within pockets uh, of senior leadership within the company. Um, so yeah, first and foremost, I guess, treating people as, uh, as people and, and going, well, this is, they have a choice of working with us. And so how do we make this actually a really pleasurable, uh, opportunity, uh, for them? Yeah. Um, and, and responding when they, they need that assistance from us. Yeah. There's actually evidence to show how important that care is, um, Gallup have been researching engagement for 40 years and they've got one statement, which is part of their Q12. And that one statement is my supervisor or someone at work seems to care about me as a person. And the more people that strongly agree with that, the higher the profit, productivity, customer service levels, and the longer people stay there. So um, it, it's not just a humane thing to do, it's also smart for business, isn't it? Oh, uh, yeah, that's uh, it's definitely my philosophy, right? You, you treat people well and then they treat the business well. It might be good, uh, Jason, if you could explain to our listeners who may not have heard of uh, you and Flourish GX exactly what you do. Yeah, so essentially my background is in occupational psychology and human factors. Um, it's a pretty niche uh, group of, of practitioners that have that uh, dual kind of uh, background. Uh, but it actually makes me really well suited to this new world of psychosocial risk management. So basically taking a health and safety lens to uh, workplace mental health. Uh, so essentially, uh, I've been building the company Flourish DX now for around about five years in its current format, where we've had a, a sole focus on psychosocial risk management. Uh, and we are essentially an end-to-end -end provider in, in um, uh, helping companies to meet uh, I guess, requirements under legislation for psychosocial risk management, but also what we just consider best practice, right? How do we create work that is good for people and doesn't harm people? Uh, and so through Flourish DX, we provide uh, education uh, and we do that through our, our own podcast, which you featured on, Graham, the Psych yep. <laughs> podcast. Uh, we do webinars uh, frequently. We even do large scale in-person training programs for uh, large organizations. Uh, we do consulting uh, and, you know, there's a lot of uh, requests for that at the moment in light of new regulations in Australia and people trying to come to grips with this and how do we embed this into our, our current approach to health and safety, for example, and then through technology. Uh, so unlike others that have been working in this space for a while, we, we've we really invested over the last five years in technology and we are a technology company, uh, essentially. Um, and so what we're trying to do is through the technology, making consultation with workers about their experience of work and the risks associated with that 
uh, more scalable and uh, getting more timely and accurate data so companies can prioritize, you know, what are the things that they need to do to care for their employees um, in, in uh, keep them productive and, and healthy and happy at work. Yeah, I guess this, um, you know, sudden focus on psychosocial risk, it's really built momentum, particularly in the last 18 months or so, where most, most states and legislations have really emphasised that it's not just about helping people cope better with stress, it's about helping to understand the root causes of stress. And have there been any surprising results that have come to you when you look at the results you've got in the last years about what are the, some of the major root causes of stress and risk? Yeah, and it's probably, it's, it's funny, Graham, um, it's, it's not a surprise to me. Uh, I've got a new term for it, which I've been using, which has only really emerged in the literature over the last few, few years. Uh, but I've been talking about it as toxic stresses, mm. um, which is hindrance demands. Mm. So um, I guess years ago, where, uh, I mean, I'm talking about 15 years ago, I remember, you know, starting to get requests from companies to come in and talk about stress. And we talk about Yerkes Dobson um, uh, yep. law and, you know, how there's an optimal level of stress and, you know, everyone has a different um, kind of uh, optimum level and, and what is good stress versus bad stress. Uh, but I, I was saying back then, hey, look, but there are some toxic stresses at work that just serve, serve no purpose. Mm -hmm. uh, so, for example, you know, layers of bureaucracy, trying to get a decision made and, you know, being, uh, you know, having to go up through hierarchies that just don't make any sense. Mm -hmm. uh, things like, you know, having to spend three quarters of your day in meetings that actually don't allow you to do your job. It's just disseminating information and really just being a hindrance. You know, emails, like trying to sort through 300 emails a day versus mm -hmm. doing your job. Um, you know, incivility or unrest within the team, like having to deal with personality uh, conflicts rather than actually, again, getting your job done. Mm. Um, and it might even just be simple things, and it came up just recently when working with a client, um, even just giving people adequate forewarning of when they're expected to be rostered on to work so that they can plan their lives around work. Uh, rather than only doing it a day or two in advance. Yeah. So um, a large part of our job is actually working with companies to do better consultation with their workforce around what are they, all these things that just make no sense, right? They cause everyone stress and they cause everyone to be dissatisfied with their job. But if we just, you know, systematically just start to work through all of those things and eliminate those things that, that serve no benefit either to the organisation or to the individual, you know, it starts to make people's lives easier they get more trust um, in the process. They start to see that when they bring something up, it's actioned by the company, their lives get better at work and you know, become less stressed and happier as well. So it's, it's not one thing. It's not really a, a surprise. I guess what's really kind of emerged is, um, you know, this terminology where we go, well, challenge challenge demands like, you know, working to a timeline or, you know, you know, stretching yourself intellectually, you know, they're, they're great in short bursts to boost motivation. And in, if talking about UX Dobson, it's actually getting us to um, that optimal level of stress. Mm. Um, but these hindrance demands that doesn't get us to an optimal level of stress, it just makes us, you know, angry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, for those listeners who may not have heard of the, of the UX Dobson stress performance curve, it basically shows that, you know, as stress rises, it can increase performance and have us being more productive and on the edge, so to speak, but it's a bell curve. And once it gets past the top of the bell, the top, it then declines. And, um, and so for any manager or leader, how do they, how do they tell when it's going past the, uh, the harmful point on that, on that stress performance curve? Yeah, well, there's two ways, right? Uh, one of them is something that we're trying to solve through technology. Um, you know, when we talk about psychosocial hazards, you know, the things at work that can cause people to become distressed, angry, or upset, mm. um, that are work factors, right? Like we're talking about workload, control, role clarity, you know, all those sorts of things. Mm. Um, when we, we talk about those things, they're invisible, largely. Um, and what we tr need to try and do is to make those invisible hazards visible, um, and we can do that through, you know, consulting with workers, getting some level of quantitative data from that. And then we can determine, hey, are we seeing changes in our people's experience of these aspects of work? And is it actually now moving from this optimal level of, of, of uh, stress to more of a destructive, destructive level? So at a, at a group level or at an organizational level, um, you know, consultation using technology and, and um, you know, risk assessments, for example, can be really helpful. But the other piece is, you know, at an individual level, you know, are individual workers empowered with the 
the language to be able to um, be able to put a, a name to these things that they're experiencing. Mm-hmm. And our leaders also having that same shared language and then being able to facilitate discussions between the employee and their leader mm-hmm. regarding when we've got a person job mismatch or when these, the, this exposure to stress is outside of a, a healthy level. Uh, and then we talk about, you know, how can the leader facilitate job crafting at an individual level to improve that person job match and reduce the stress that the person's experiencing unnecessarily. Yeah. Back uh, in March of this year, I put a post on LinkedIn, which essentially said that the best way to boost employee mental health is to give them good managers. And it just went nuts. It it ended up having 2.7 million views, comments, shares, etc. It just really struck a chord, not just in Australia, but around the world. Is it that simple? Uh, obviously, managers have to know what to do to help address the issues. But, uh, you know, how do we get better managers? How do we get better managers that, of course, data is one part of it, but also intuitively understanding what happens in the office on a day-to-day basis? Yeah, I I saw that post like uh, most of the world, I think, Graham. Uh, It's funny, anything that you write about leadership um, tends to do pretty well on um, on LinkedIn, which is why I think Simon Sinek and people like Adam Grant have such a great following because they they write about leadership um, frequently. Um, But... I think with leaders, um, uh, we, you know, it's been commented on frequently, right, that many leaders are promoted into those positions of leadership because they're very good technically uh, yeah. at their jobs and don't necessarily have the right leadership attributes. And so we really need to be looking at who are we promoting into leadership positions, first of all, but then what are we doing to make them good leaders and continue to develop them as leaders rather than just technical contributors uh, in order for them to have that positive impact on on the workers around them. But but the piece I've, I've noticed is, is really missing is their understanding of just basic things they should understand in relation to um, psychological health and safety, which is understanding things like job demands and job resources. Mm. What are the things, again, that um, I can use strategically as a manager, as a challenge demand to increase motivation, but make sure I'm using that in moderation and strategically to ensure that it doesn't lead to burnout? Um, how am I paving the way or getting rid of these hindrance demands that serve no purpose? And then what are the job resources? Like, can I give people more decision-making latitude in their role, for example? Um, do I need to pair them with um, supportive colleagues who can maybe have a different skill set that can kind of round them off or, or facilitate something that they, they don't really um, understand? Mm. Um, can I make accommodations when I know that there are personal things going on in the person's life that is actually going to... Um, you know, have a detrimental effect on on their work performance. Like if they broke their leg, for example, we would make a physical accommodation. But if someone um, had a very sick partner or it was going through a messy divorce or something, is there some level of accommodation I can make, you know, to to support them or not overburden them, noting that their resilience is going to be less at work um, for some of the normal demands that they'd be able to handle when they're healthy and, you know, they don't have these other things going on. So I think, um, and, and I've noticed that just talking, like we've, we, been doing our own professional practice program recently um, for health and safety and HR practitioners. And, you know, this language around job demands and job resources uh, was new to a lot of these people. So I'm thinking, well, people leaders <laughs> probably in the main don't don't know these things. Mm-hmm. So I think it's another really important thing to add to their, their knowledge and toolkit so that they understand, first of all, and then they know how to actually leverage uh, demands and resources effectively to prevent burnout increase motivation and engagement and also uh, reduce the likelihood of harm occurring. Yeah. What um, have you found the implications that COVID forced on the workplace? You know, we obviously went not so much UNWA, but certainly in Victoria and New South Wales, just huge implications in how we work. Did it, did it change how managers and leaders need to manage? Oh, absolutely, without a doubt, right? So um, obviously those micromanagers that needed to be uh, involved in every decision, be able to watch uh, all their employees closely, they didn't have that ability anymore, right? So okay. um, I think these types of leaders, the you know command and control type leaders, they would have had a lot of difficulty adapting to the, the new world of work where you actually needed to rely a lot on trust and relationships, right? Um, when you couldn't supervise people so directly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so I think it was a challenge for many leaders. Those that already were doing the whole relationship and trust um, thing, I think they would have fared a lot better, right? 
Yeah. So it really depends on your own leadership style and I guess where you are in your own maturity and walk as a leader, like who would have done uh, well or, or not so well. Um, it definitely changed people's experience of psychosocial hazards. And it's not necessarily that it all got worse, like, you know, people are isolated. And there was a big concern right in Australia. I remember the government moving quite quickly to increase uh, access to telehealth, for example, because they're worried about the effects of isolation on yeah. people's mental health. But it's interesting what we observed during COVID was that people uh, in the main were less stressed. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe that's because they didn't have as much pressure on their work-life balance because they didn't have commuting time. Mm -hmm. Maybe it was because they had more decision-making latitude about when they worked, right? They could go out for a run during the day or walk the dog or whatever, and then maybe work later into the evening. So they had more ability to kind of craft their work around their life rather than life having to fit around their work, which was, was, which was normal. And also maybe they were able to get away from if they, for example, had incivility in the workplace or colleagues that they didn't get along with, they were able to isolate themselves from that particular hazard, right? So there would have been less bullying and harassment, for example, because people weren't in close proximity with each other anymore. Yeah. So yeah, interesting. Yeah, the the, the changing um, nature of, of leadership, people had to move to that uh, trust and relationship model versus the command and, um, and, and um, you know, push, push uh, kind of culture. And then for uh, individual workers themselves, like, the world of work and their experience of work would have changed dramatically as well, but didn't necessarily lead to a more stressful or worse uh, mental health outcome. In some cases, it actually led to a better mental health. But things haven't suddenly improved, have they? I saw Deloitte put out a study in June 2023, and it showed that um, both managers and employees were always or often overwhelmed, stressed, and depressed, almost half of employees and managers. So does it surprise you that, you know, this hasn't suddenly got back to what it was and suddenly hasn't reduced, you know, the, the incidence of uh, stress in the workplace and absenteeism, presenteeism, et cetera? I do have some uh, cynicism about some of the, the data that's come out. I mean, I've seen some wild estimates that 60% of the workforce, for example, is experiencing burnout. Uh, which is a load of bollocks, quite frankly. <laughs> um, but it's, it's how we understand these things, right? And sometimes we use simple measures um, and convenient samples um, to complete these these uh, types of activities that Deloitte do, uh, which kind of skews the data. I, I think that one of the more objective data sources that we have, and, and again, people will, will challenge that too, would be workers' compensation uh, statistics. Mm -hmm. So in Australia, not worldwide, but in Australia, we do have a workers' compensation scheme. So if um, something at work causes them to be ill or injured, including mentally ill, then that can be um, covered by uh, insurance. Now, uh, what we did notice is that in the last reporting period um, that came out, that was for 21-22, so on the tail end of COVID, um, the total number of claims actually reduced for the first time in about seven years. It'd been gradually going up, and we're actually escalating at quite a, a rapid pace, so about 75% up. Uh, over five years, um, the year before, uh, up to a maximum of just over 12,100 claims, about uh, 10, close to 10% of all uh, compensation claims were mental health related. But in the last reported period, tail end of COVID, we saw the first reduction in claims in about seven years. Mm -hmm. um, so what we're seeing is maybe less total claims, um, but then the complexity of claims completes, continues to go up. So back seven years ago, Graham, it was about 19 weeks was the median of time that was um, uh, compensated for for the, the median mental health injury. Um, in the last reporting period, it was 34 weeks. Mm. Um, so now, if you actually factor in the, over the last seven years, the increasing uh, number of claims for mental injuries, and then also the complexity of claims, uh, it now accounts, in the last reporting period, 400,000 weeks were compensated for for mental injuries. And these are all deemed to be work-related, right? Which yeah. means that they could have been avoided um, if, again, we had better structures and systems at work and more caring and, 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 and leaders that could respond in a timely and, 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 and proper manner. But in terms of a proportion of all claims, it's almost 40% of every injury and illness claim in Australia, yeah. uh, the weeks lost was due to mental injuries. It's a huge amount. Um, and so, yeah, we're, we're starting to see some conflicting data out there, right? So we're seeing that was actually a slight reduction in total claims, 
but the complexity continues to go up and the bucket of weeks loss due to compensable illness and injuries continues to increase at a rate that's just unsustainable. And I've also heard a different slant on that decline in workers' comp injuries that people were more hidden during COVID. They didn't have to front directly people. They could um, you know, hide a little bit, not uh, work under so much stress. So you know, I've heard others say they expect it to rise again. We'll have to uh, to wait and see, but uh, you know, um, on, on that on that notion, Graham. I mean, I think it now um, it is actually almost on parity with self report data from the UK. So the UK do the labour force survey through the health and safety executive every year, um, and in their last reporting period, forty six percent of time loss, self reported time loss due to illness and injury was due to work related stress, depression, or anxiety. Yeah. So we're actually getting pretty close to um, self report data in the UK. So I was actually thinking, um, oh, we've got a long way to go. We've we're only about ten percent of total claims being mental illness related. But if you're looking at time loss related to to it, it's actually getting pretty close to parity with self report data from the UK. So um, I'm more optimistic that we're maybe getting closer to the ceiling than what what I was before. Do you need more psych health and safety in your life? Then head over to the Flourish DX Academy for several free on demand e learning courses. If you're an internal professional. Follow Flourish DX on Eventbrite to register for any of our free fortnightly interactive webinars. Our flagship professional practice program is also exclusively available for internal professionals. The 12-week course blends theory, applied practice, and interaction with other professionals through live lectures and a monthly community of practice session. Find out more about all these learning opportunities or inquire about a bespoke in-house training at the Flourish DX Academy www.45003.org. Now back to this episode. One thing that um, blew me away, like I, I've asked many times, I'm sure you have companies, what's the cost of your absenteeism? They don't know. Mm. They don't know. And I did a webinar once um, with uh, Stephen Moyer. He runs a group called the Moyer Group, and it's primarily chief financial officers and finance directors. And we directly asked, do they measure the cost of absenteeism? 90% didn't. So it's one thing to talk about risk, but the first part of risk is understanding what our current costs are to be able to track it. You know, the absentees and the presentees and the, the employee turnover. Are you able to help clients to do that? Or, uh, or have, have you seen clients really pursue that to try and understand it and look at the root causes and that sort of thing? Yeah, we're increasingly looking at ways to get this discussion happening at the C-suite, uh, and it's great now with, um, I guess, uh, with regulations. This is now a workplace health and safety um, obligation, so it's a legal risk and also a reputational risk if companies don't actually meet their workplace health and safety requirements. So it has gotten now to board level and, and to the C-suite, but we continue to have to advocate for why would we invest in a particular intervention? Because mm. I can see most large companies – the fines for you know um, failing to meet their, their legislative requirements under workplace health and safety law, it's uh you know it's it's minuscule, right? Fine. Um, yeah. So we've got to talk about well, what is the case for change? And so ROI is something that we support our, our clients to to work out. The problem with things like um, absenteeism, though, is you're talking about a fixed cost. You've got a budget expense for salary, right? And you're going to continue to pay it regardless of whether people are at work or not. Mm. Um, turnover though is, is a risk, um, that there is a cost associated with. Um, and we help uh, our clients to break that down if they want, you know, you can look at, well, what is the average salary that you pay someone? What would be the cost of backfilling a position if you had to get a, a temporary person in? Mm. Um, what would the recruitment cost be, uh, as a proportion of salary? Um, and ultimately what you end up getting is somewhere between 50 to 200%, rec- um, uh, of someone's salary. Mm. is the replacement cost, right? Yeah. So if you can look at what is the uh, likely attrition due to um, you know exposure to psychosocial hazards, which we can do now um, through our algorithms and our platform, uh, we can then put a, we, we can then work out, hey, well, within a part of the business, if we could compare it across the business, well, we've got 30% higher turnover intention in that particular part compared to that one. Mm. We can say, well, look, you've got 100 people working in that. If it's thirty percent higher, that's three hundred. Oh, that's thirty people that are going to, you know, quit, mm. um, and that's going to be a higher amount than the baseline or the benchmark across the organisation. Let's say it's a hundred percent salary 
cost to replace. That's $3 million. So the, um, the absentees and presenteeism one's hard because it's a fixed cost. You're kind of committed to paying a salary regardless of whether people are there or not. The turnover one is a direct cost because you've got a cost of replacing someone. And when we've got record employment levels like we have in Australia at the moment, it's actually becoming more costly and more difficult to replace. Mm. The, the, the other issue which doesn't necessarily fit into ROI is the increased burden that it puts on people in terms of overwork. So there's a, an increased burnout risk, right? If you're in a team and you're like, you may be 50% down as some teams are I've come across mm. in terms of what your ideal uh, headcount is. Mm. Um, so these people are still expected to achieve the same outcomes, but with sometimes 50% less headcount uh, mm. in their teams. And so that, in, that further obviously increases work overload, increases burnout risk, and it also increases attrition risk for those, le- those remainders um, in, in the organization. So yeah, I, I guess just a big one there, Graham. Uh, if you're trying to work out ROI, absentees and presenteeism won't get you too far, um, I think, when you talk to CFOs, because it's kind of like a fixed cost. Um, they're paying regardless, but the uh, the attrition turnover cost is, is a big one. They don't they don't feel that way at all. They really do feel that that's something that they can address. They need to raise it in front of people. That was the overwhelming response from this webinar. So, you know, gone are the days of CFOs just looking at numbers and you know, dividend yields and percentages, they see that as highlighting the right measures to have in place for their people. And I know, I know um, you know, you have um, some reservations about some studies that are out there, but there was a study, another study by Deloitte actually in 2020 in the UK, and it was the case for investment. And they identified that um, 44% of absenteeism was due to um, mental health, mental ill health. You said it's 46, it might have gone up to 46 now. They also found or estimated that um, the cost of presenteeism related to uh, mental health issues is 4.4 times the cost of absenteeism. And the cost they had for employee turnover is 1.1 times the cost of employee absenteeism. So, We've, we've tried to address that and make it a very easy thing to measure. And on the homepage of the We Care 365 website, we've got a mental, mental ill health calculator, which um, you just put in the, the number of employees, your estimated average salary. Um, it adds on super and then does those calculations to bring the total figures. It's a huge number in any organisation. It is huge. It's – and, and – you know, if you were able to reduce that cost by 10%, 20%, it would be an astronomical return on investment, absolutely astronomical. And, uh, you know, I, I, I love the work you're doing to help identify some of these root causes, but we also need to really push this uh, financial cost of doing nothing as well. Yeah, I am. Um, I'll have to check out your calculator versus ours. I, I look because we've got a calculator on our website too, which looks at absentees and presenteeism, and then turnover cost. Um, we're using an Australian study which found that um, on average four days per employee were lost to stress um, for absenteeism, um, and then six days due to presenteeism. Mm-hmm. So I have seen varying estimates, right, of like like you say, the Deloitte one is 4.4 times absenteeism as presenteeism. Um, I think I saw someone claiming 10 times greater, which I think is a bit of a furphy. Um, so ours is more conservative, so I'd be interested to uh, to compare the, the two. Yeah. Um, but what I found, like if you think about it, like PwC did one of the earliest ROI studies, right, yeah. um, back in 2014 yeah. um, on, you know, what is the uh, return on investment you can see for mental health interventions in the workplace. Yeah. That was $2.40 back then. And I think that latest one that you've run, you mentioned from Deloitte, was that six or nine pounds per, per pound? And in, in, in any case, what we found is it doesn't matter what the return on investment is, the, the, the dollar or pound amount is not move the needle. Um, it has not caused companies to thoroughly review what they're doing, where they're spending the money, how effective that is. Uh, definitely not to the same degree as what regulations have. Yeah. So, so interesting, right? Because like we've been working on this exclusively, psych health and safety for five years, yeah. um, knowing that this was the right thing to do. Um, we needed to take more of a systems-based approach and a risk-based approach. Mm. Um, and it, but it wasn't until it became regulated in Australia and most states now have regulations in force um, around this, 
that have we started to see like just this massive flood of companies going, all right, now we need to do it that way because we have to do it that way. We're told we have to. Um, so it's, it's interesting. Um, and it's, it's an observation I made over the last 10 years, having worked, worked in this space for a period of time, like yourself, Graham, although you probably have a few more years in it than I do, but I've not seen the ROI, um, uh, because there's been good, good research out there, good studies from top four, um, uh, you know, uh, accountancies, um, oh, sorry, um, uh, you know, uh, management consultants, all the rest has not moved the needle in the way that we've wanted to. Uh, and we've just continued to see that in- increasing rate of mental ill health in organizations over the last 10 years. But they're not measuring it. You know, it's not there. You know, as I said, 90% of CFOs don't know what the cost is. <laughs> oh, and this is, this is also the problem, Graham. Like if you escalate any ROI study, any benchmark, in fact, up to an exec level, I'll give you 10, 10 reasons at least why it doesn't apply to them and why they're different. Um, so we always say the best data an organization can have is their own. So like you say, they should be measuring all of their own factors like absenteeism. They should try and work out presenteeism. They should work out their turnover costs and try and work out what proportion of that is related to mental ill health. Get their own data. Um, and that's this is also for anyone working in an organization trying to get the ear of the C-suite. Get mm-hmm. your own data. They'll make a much more compelling argument than using this, um, this, you know, con- this data from management consultants uh, as an industry benchmark. I have not seen that move the needle, um, but I have seen internal data like you're referring to, Graham. Um, yeah. You know, actually capture the 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 hearts and minds of the exec. It should be on the board's agenda. You know, they're responsible for the health and well-being of the employees. Why is it on the board's agenda? In fact, uh, I must find someone to really drill about that in the board side of things because they're responsible for the risk. Why aren't they responsible for the cost? Why aren't they making sure that the cost's being monitored? Mm. Yeah, and look, uh, I think, you know, cost is one thing, but there's other, um, you know, factors that they can take into as well, like, you know, um, what are our gaps to compliance and are we, you know, are we compliant? Um, what is our lag data that we've got? So how many... You know, uh, mental injuries are we having? How many, um, uh, how many, uh, like days, uh, of leave have, have been accrued? Um, which could give you uh, an idea that people aren't taking their breaks that they're supposed to. You know, how many overtime hours are being worked? So there's a number of factors. And, um, Tegan Modderman, who's the men- uh, chief mental health officer at, at Queensland Rail, recently shared with me her dashboard that she's got, which has basically identified all the different data sources that she could get her hands on across the organization that feeds up into a, a, a Power BI dashboard that yeah. gives her a really good sense that she can then report very easily then to the exec and board around this is the state of play in relation to mental health in the organization. And only part of that is the um, the, the ROI, if you like. Yeah. Who's been a really important um, mentor in your career? Is there anyone been one or a few people, Jason, or books, or what? What, what have you found really inf- influential in your life? Yeah, I guess I'm. I'm just um, always curious about not just my subject matter, so psych health and safety, and and um, you know, organisational psychology in in general, uh, but I guess around running a business, um, and that includes all things like you know. Um, how do you lead well? How do you um, do marketing well? How do you do sales? How do you um, generate a community and build a brand? Like I'm interested in all that stuff, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and in fact, you know, back in the day when I was in year twelve, I, my my first preference when going to uni, which I didn't get, <laughs> was to do a, a commerce and psychology degree because they're kind of my two passions. And as a CEO now, I get to um, you know to to exercise both of those, which is yeah. great. Um, but I guess, yeah, I, I learn from a lot of different sources. So I learn a lot from podcasts. So yep. people like Adam Grant, I really look up to as someone who's like very good at understanding the um, the academic side, but then making it really easily, uh, or he translated, <laughs> it seems very, very easily for him, yeah. uh, translates it into something that is operational. Same with people like um, Drew Ray and David Proven in the health and safety sense. They have a great podcast called um, Safety at Work, uh, yep. sorry, The Safety of Work. And uh, they, uh, again, take good research and then distill it down into this is actually what it means and how you would actually use it. Yeah. Um, trailblazers in this area, I really look up to are people like Marianne Baton, who, you know, hosted our Canada version of the podcast. She's referred to as the godmother of psych health and safety over in Canada <laughs> for her involvement in their development of their national standard. And she's a good friend of mine. And other people like, you know, David Burrows, Angela Martin um, here in, in Australia and Tegan Monaghan as well. 
you know, I see them as being really influential in how I, you know, look at our mental health in the workplace and really what we're doing at Flourish GX is standing on the, the shoulders of uh, giants, if you like, in terms of all the work that's gone before us over the last couple of decades and now really making it something that our organizations can pick up on. So there's, there's a few names. Uh, people to look what up. about from a, a leadership perspective? Obviously, Adam Grant covers that sort of area, but mm. are, there, are, are there particularly other podcasts that delve into the leadership side of things or are there books that have had a big impact on you? Uh, if you read books in the last couple of years, um, what comes to mind about leadership and culture in terms of um, being influential? Yeah, I'm actually um, fortunate to be surrounded by some uh, successful CEOs myself um, who I get more of that through mentoring. Um, I, I guess, you know, having studied and being immersed in organisational psychology for close to 20 years now, you know, a lot of the concepts around leadership, you know, pretty well instilled. So I really like, um, you know, learning from people's experiences and being able to reflect on, you know, what's going on at the moment in my work and then you know, people being able to draw out, you know, anecdotes from their own experience and sharing those with me at, at, at timely, uh, when it's timely for me. Uh, so, yeah, there's a uh, couple of CEOs in particular who had quite successful careers that, um, you know, they're kind of a good sounding board for me. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, a fellow director in, in Flourish DX who, um, you know, has been on board since we uh, we started this journey, um, you know, quite a while ago, first raised money for the business back in 2018. Um, and he's been a really great sounding board uh, as yeah. well. Uh, fabulous. Have you ever had a significant setback in your career? Oh, uh, you haven't done a startup, have you, Graham? <laughs> <laughs> um, nothing that's killed me, but uh, there's some definitely some new death experiences. It's uh, called the Valley of Death uh, for a reason when you're doing a startup. Um, I remember you know, even as recently as about four years ago, taking a screenshot of our bank, ba bank, bank balance, which was less than $200 at the time. Uh, we're fortunate to uh, have taken on some private equity last year and have a very healthy uh, cash uh, balance at the moment. But, um, you know, I, I've taken that screenshot to remind me that, you know, there have been some tough times and, you know, um, it's, uh, yeah, a lot of, lot of near-death experiences, uh, Graham, but nothing that was a significant setback that um, I couldn't recover from. Well, having two hundred dollars in the bank, I think, is a a pretty scary thing. When you've got three employees too, right? Like, you know. <laughs> how did you approach that? But you obviously must have been fearful of not being able to pay salaries and all that sort of thing. How did mm. you approach that and able to move? How did you move through that valley of death with that particular situation where you had just two hundred dollars in the bank? Yeah, so I, I guess um, you know, at that time it was just me and three software developers, right, um, including my CTO, uh, and we. It was really on me to like, you know, decide what is it that the market wanted and then to to market it, to sell it, to, you know, make sure you invoice and got the money in and had the cash flow and, and all the rest. Um, and at that time it was, uh, I knew we had a, a big deal that was about to land and there was money coming in. But again, it was because of the trust that I was able to have built up in that in the team, them knowing I always had their back. And there was times when I wouldn't pay myself in order to make sure that I was paying paying them and they were, they were aware of that. Um, and in this case, I knew that one member of the team that, you know, we're a team of four at the time, um, couldn't go without missing a salary. And I was, I knew there was money coming in within, you know, might even, I think it was only three or four days late, right. That I had to pay a couple of other employees, but I just had that discussion saying, Hey, um, I know you guys are okay. You don't live week to week like this other person does. Like, are you happy if I pay you a few days late this week? So it was just, um, that, and, and I guess, you know, just, and I've got all of those people still on board in the company, right. I think when you, you treat people that, like that, you, and Simon Sinek talks about it a lot, right? Putting leaders eat last, you know, put other people yeah. first. You're, you're responsible for making sure that they get theirs before you get yours. Yeah. Um, I think they've seen that over and over again. And, you know, that's, that's kind of like how I lead, um, making sure that everyone gets what they need. And then I work out what's left for me to take it. <laughs> what do you do with your team to make it, um, psychologically safe? People feel, safe challenge an idea you, you may have or suggesting new things that are out of left field. How do you make it safe? Oh, I, Graham, I, I've been incredibly successful <laughs> for any psychological safety, probably to my detriment. People are very, <laughs> very happy to tell me what they think. Um, and I think, uh, look, humour is one of my 
um, character strengths and um, self-deprecation is one of my go-to. So <laughs> I think, you know, people see that I take the piss out of myself and so they're willing to like point out as well when I uh, make an error in judgment. But I guess it's how I've been responding historically as well, right? Where, where I've been willing to admit, actually, you know what? I don't know. And I'm very willing to say to people when I recruit them, hey, this is a gap that I have in my own understanding or my own skill set. That's why I'm recruiting you, right? Uh, I like what Steve Jobs says about that. You know, we don't recruit smart people to tell them what to do. We recruit them to tell us what to do, right? Yeah. And it's something that I'm, uh, I guess we live every day here. Like we got very intelligent people across the board in very different disciplines in some sense. Uh, we've got some great management consultants, financial people, psychologists, obviously, software developers, engineers. Um, they all bring different skill sets and I'm not going to be a master of all those things. Yeah. Um, so people are, are very willing to tell me, um, you know, what they really think. And my wife, in fact, has visited some uh, once and, uh, yeah, she got quite shocked <laughs> at how blunt they could be. They're like, are you their boss? I'm like, yeah, but <laughs> it's, uh, I see it more as a team, right? We're all going towards the same thing. We don't all have the answer ourselves. We, we need to leverage um, the experience and knowledge that other people have. What do you do for your own self-care? How do you keep fuel in your tank? Uh, yeah, I practice energy management. Um, in fact, I saw Mr. Beast, uh, who some of you listeners might not know about, um, you know, one of the most successful content creators ever, if not the most successful content creators on YouTube ever. And he talks about how he would work in stints where he might work 10 days straight and then just collapse for a day or two. Mm. Um, and I find myself, I'm, I'm probably at the same, like I'll work over weekends and I'll do a bit. And I do quite a bit of work outside of work um, with my kids. Like they have hectic sporting schedules and whatnot. Um, so I really just need to practice energy management. And, you know, on a Tuesday afternoon, if I'm knackered, oh, we've got a, um, a couch in a dark room. I'll go and have a nap. Um, sometimes I'll just make sure when I get home, the laptop stays in the bag. It doesn't come out, you know, for, for the evening. Um, you know, uh, so I do that. And then, you know, uh, I try um, and eat well during the week in particular. I, you know, try and exercise, uh, those sorts of things. I'm uh, I, I am someone who really likes my sleep as well. So I'm getting seven to nine hours consistently too. Um, but the big thing for me is energy management, right? If my body's telling you, hey, you're exhausted, you're tired, take a nap, don't work tonight, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, I remember even just two weeks ago, right? It was one o'clock on a Friday afternoon. I actually didn't have any more meetings for that the rest of the day. And I was knackered. I'd done a trip to New Zealand. That was all of 15 hours in, in the country. So it was like, you know what? I'm exhausted. I've done my time this week. I'm out of here. Uh, so yeah, that, that's uh, that's a big thing for me, Jason. I know you've got a number of um, resources and services on your website, and uh, a conference coming up. Do you want to give a quick background about that? Yeah, uh, as I mentioned, one of the key pillars for us at Flourish TX is uh, education. Uh, so we have a weekly podcast, which again you featured on Graham um, uh, some little while ago now, uh, the Psych Health and Safety Podcast. But uh, one hundred and 50 or so episodes uh, in our back catalogue. So if you're interested in what we've talked about today, then that's a great resource. Uh, we do have a free e-learning academy called the Flourish DX Academy, which you can find just by doing a Google search. And it's got free training on things like the ISO 45003 standard for psych health and safety at work and uh, how to conduct a psychosocial risk assessment and, and things like that. Um, we run uh pretty much fortnightly webinars for free for internal people and safety professionals. And you can find that on Eventbrite if you look up Flourish DX. And then finally, yeah, as you mentioned, we're really excited to be announcing our first big two-day in-person and hybrid conference uh, that will be in Sydney on 19th to 20th uh, of next year in June. And we're flying over some great international speakers like Michael Leiter and then some great international experts um, either speaking from a expertise in their academic perspective or, you know, giving some really great case studies about what they're doing well in their organisation. And if you had to, um, you know, suggest one new ritual that uh, a manager or a leader could incorporate every day to improve or reduce psychosocial risk, what would that be? I know there's not one size fits all, but do you have a, a thought about something simple that people could do every day? Yeah, and it's... um. Probably more so to do with the, the team, right? Um, I, I found role clarity is something that can cause a lot of undue stress, but can actually be one of the easiest things to eliminate as a hazard as well. Uh, we, when we talk about the hierarchy of controls, particularly when you apply it to psychosocial risk, uh, elimination can be hard. I mean, you can't eliminate workload, right? Um, but there are specific hazards you can. And 
just people not being aware of, you know, what is their responsibilities, where does it begin and end, how are they going to be successful, what are the priorities maybe of the business on a given month, week, year, whatever. So just getting alignment. So we actually initiated that, um, not not necessarily a daily, but a weekly alignment session with say our, our marketing team. Uh, I I work on whims often, and they were getting quite stressed out by me just putting these things that seem to be coming out of the blue at them all the time. So we initiated initiated just a short uh, ten to twenty minute meeting on a Monday morning, going, "Hey, these are the things that we're you know thinking about over the coming week. So if it does land on your desk with a short turnaround time, um, you know." prioritize it over everything else. That's the priority, um, but just be aware it's coming. So it, it, it just created a lot less, you know, stress about, oh, crap, what's going to land on my desk yeah, this yeah. week and, and be asked to be turned around within the next hour. Yeah. yeah, no worries. And just a couple of things that, or a few things that uh, WeCare365 provide our website. You should know WeCare365.com.au. We've got that um, mental ill health calculator. We only have to put in the number of employees and the average uh, salary to get a a good figure there. And the money you could save if you reduced it by 20%. Um, The other thing we have is a building mentally healthy culture checklist where we have all the things about um, launching an initiative, having a great launch and keeping the momentum going for over um, a year afterwards. And our We Care Manager training program, it's 50 minutes of e-learning, followed by 12 nudge videos, about two minutes each, so you get one per week. And it's just a little idea to create a bit more humanity in the workplace. You know, there's an idea about, uh, you know, really ask people how they're going. Stop and really ask and and listen um, about, uh, you know, just simple things we can do each day. I finish by always asking this question, Jason. Um, If you could go back now to your 18-year-old self when you were I guess, just beginning your psychology, knowing what you know now, what advice would you give your 18-year-old self? Um, yeah, that's a good one. Uh, well, back when I was 18, I was unsure exactly what I wanted to do with my psychology degree. So you're right, I would have been in my first year at that stage. And I think at the time, I actually wanted to be a Christian counsellor, <laughs> um, not really understanding the full breadth of what you know you can do at, 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 with the discipline of psychology. Um, so yeah, look, maybe I would have encouraged myself to look at things like organizational psychology, which I didn't even know existed as a discipline at, at the time, but also be willing to look at more systems, systems thinking maybe it's, so it took me a while, right? It took me probably 10 years of my working career as a psychologist to start thinking more about systems rather than individuals. So maybe, yeah, maybe starting to think more about that systems and looking at things through a systems lens first, um, than the individual. Great one. And if you're just listening to The Caring CEO for the first time, we've got 55 episodes now published. We've interviewed, we describe a caring CEO as a senior leader that champions a culture of care and a culture of high performance. Some of the people that we've interviewed um, in the last couple of years include the CEO of Microsoft, uh, the CEO of of Bunnings, uh, Deloitte, the Secretary of the Department of Customer Service in New South Wales, the CEO of Starlight Foundation, Are You OK?, the Wayside Chapel in Sydney. So uh, check it out. There might be some uh, a bit of inspiration there for you as well. Thanks for being part of The Caring CEO, Jason. Thanks again for having me, Graham. You've been listening to the Psych Health and Safety Podcast. To stay up to date with the latest on psychological injury prevention, follow Flourish DX on LinkedIn and subscribe to the Psych Health and Safety Podcast at www.psychhealthandsafety.com.